Uh, this panel is Cultivating the Craft of Software Engineering. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, software as craft. Um, Corey Ladislaw from Hello. Off Grid Electric uh, is moderating. Justin Campbell from HashiCorp. Um, Sarah Gray from Promptworks. Audrey Trout from SnipSnap uh, are all here. Clara Bennett, unfortunately, uh, couldn't make it. Um, but uh, we, let's uh, welcome our panel. Thanks for the intro, Jason. Uh, so, like you said, my name is Corey Ladislaw. I work at Off Grid Electric. Um, I'm installing solar in rural Africa. So if you want to know more about that, I can tell you later. Uh, Android GDE and formerly ran the Android Meetup group. And we're going to go around and introduce ourselves a little bit more. And next, Audrey. Hi, I'm Audrey Trout, and I'm director of mobile at SnipSnap. If you haven't heard of SnipSnap, it's a local Philly startup uh, just down the street here. It is a coupon app for iOS and Android. So I'm an iOS and Android developer, and I've been doing mobile for, oh, I don't know, three, three, four years at this point. I uh, have a long history in um, like Java and, and web application development before that, uh, both as a, as a contract, often as a, as a software uh, contractor. and. Um, I came into software development through a program at Penn called MCIT, which one of our other panelists is also uh, uh, a graduate of. And uh, my, my background before that was music and physics. So I had a very unconventional approach to software development via liberal arts and music and physics, and then finally into software development, uh, where I found my home. And I really love it. Hi. I'm uh, Justin Campbell. I currently work for HashiCorp. We make um, Tools for developers and operations people to deploy software uh, more safely. Um, I'm probably up here because I started the Software as Craft group uh, two years ago, year and a half ago, something like that, uh, in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been developing software for uh, six years, uh, mostly in Ruby, uh, sometimes in some other languages. And then before that, I was a uh, systems engineer for a, a while. Uh, Hi, I'm Sarah Gray, uh, and I'm an engineer here at PromptWorks. Um, as Audrey mentioned, we both came out of the same MCAT program, and I also had a liberal arts background before I started in software development. I was an English major, hooray. Um, and then I went into networking and, and other things. Um, now I program in Ruby and Python. I'm one of the organizers for the Software's Craft Group um, here in Philadelphia. I'm also an organizer for the Philly Python user group, and I teach through GDI and do various other things. Um, yeah. Awesome. So it sounds like we have a lot of experience here on the panel. Um, so what is craft personship or craftsmanship or craftswomanship or crafts non-binary uh, ship mean to you? I don't have a note for that one in particular. But So a craftsmanship, and, I, and I'm going to use the term craftsmanship for lack of creativity or, or thought perhaps, but um, to me, you know, what, what we do as programmers, as software developers, there, there is a craft to it. It is more than just, you know, hammering uh, widgets together. And there's some thought and learning that has to go into the small choices that we make every day in our code. And, um, you know, to me, you know, that craftsmanship is that attention to these small details, which isn't, isn't the big feature that you build, it isn't the application package that you deliver, but it's, you know, the, the name of that method or, you know, how you refactor this, um, you know, program flow uh, to make more sense to the developer uh, who comes behind you. And also, in addition to those small changes that you make as a developer, uh, when you're writing code day to day, I think craftsmanship to me is also like your longer term growth, uh, that you're continuously learning about new patterns, you're, you're learning about new practices and, and being thoughtful about the software that you're creating um, over time. It's that long term kind of attention and growth uh, that, that really makes it craftsmanship, that you're, you're always getting better. Uh, the, the code that you wrote six months ago you know, always looks terrible and that's because you've learned so much uh, in that time. Yeah, I think you made an interesting point. Like, I think of it as poetry, basically, or writing, to make sure that it's like readable paragraphs that people, when they come in later, know what I was talking about. Yeah, I would, I, that was well put. Um, yeah, just to your second point, or I, w I would add to it a little bit more of, um, like, for me, uh, in almost like in a selfish way, like, I really love um, what I do, and I, and I want to get better at it and keep improving. Uh, and I would never want to just have uh, programming be 
just this like day job thing that I just do, uh, like you said, hammering widgets, and you know that's just my entire day. And then I move on to the next day. Um, like uh, Pam Sell, Sally uh, said um, during a talk once that like like software craftsmanship gives her a like purpose for her work. Like it's it's more involved than just like you know hammering widgets. It's actually like you know putting yourself into your profession. Um, so I kind of identify a lot with that. So. Yeah, and Pam will be on, I believe, a panel later today as well. So we talked a little bit about what we wanted to discuss during the panel. Um, and I really struggled with that idea of craftsmanship. Um, mostly, I think, um, the gender binary stuff is tricky. Um, and also because I think part of craftsmanship, for me at least, is not just, am I building the thing in front of me that I've been asked to build correctly, but do I understand uh, enough about the business to know that I'm making the right thing? Um, do I, am I making the right thing that makes sense for the industry? So maybe I'm building something in a really esoteric language. Um, so that's awesome. I know how to do it. But when I move on, will this be useful for my employer? Um, I think there's a, that additional layer um, beyond the tools you have with you. I love that point. Like I've never thought about that other businessy stuff that I do as part of my craftspersonship. But yeah, great point. Cool, so how does craftspersonship look different in your day to day? What are some of the examples of how you practice it as you're working through a story or whatever you're doing? Um, you know, for me, my, my first thought is always um, tests. Um, I kind of find that most of what I do with, with code and programming and everything kind of starts there. Like that drives a lot of my other decisions out um, for how I structure things and how I, how I practice. Like that is kind of, um, I don't know, maybe like a woodworker where we start with like sharp tools or maybe like a, a chef starts like mise en place. Uh, I always start by writing tests before I do anything else and that kind of helps me drive out the rest of the things. Uh, I gave some examples earlier about, you know, it's the thought that you put into what am I going to name this? Or, you know, if you're, if you're adding to an existing app, which, you know, I always am, you know, an existing class, and you're like, well, there's something new that this needs to do, and does it make sense to add this here, or is this an opportunity to refactor? The, that, that moment, before you, you know, put your hands to the keyboard, ne necessarily, to think about uh, the approach that you're going to take, like, that, to me, is, is where the craftsmanship, and where I pull from my, my learning and experience um, in, in thinking about craftspersonship, and, and uh, good crafting, crafting good, clean code. Uh, and you know that's that's where I feel that, and I think you know the the output is you know when you look back at something you wrote a while ago and say wow like this totally makes sense, or when someone else comes on board and they're like oh well, I can see where I want to add this because it just it just makes sense like that's where it's evident afterward, and the thought is is where the craftsmanship happens you know before you start typing, so it's everything around the typing I guess I'm saying. I I love that you said mise en place because like. That, that is such, that is how I begin every project, um, by like clearing my stash on Git and nuking all my branches on my local machine and then nuking the, the remote ones that have already been merged and meticulous just note taking um, in cards. J just because once, um, once you have that plan, it's, it's much easier to execute and that, that tiny sliver of planning um, helps so much, at least for me, um, to shut out the noise and, and work towards something really good. Awesome. So um, what was it that made that change that made you start thinking of yourself as a crass person? For me, I'm not quite sure where it was. Somewhere probably at Comcast. I don't know. Other people were talking about testing and all that stuff. At the time, I wasn't a believer. Um, but eventually, I started doing it myself. And then that kind of did it. But I was always focusing more on the business side of the house instead of getting better at the coding side. And eventually, I kind of evolved from there. So share your paths, please. So I, I hope I'm not stealing Audrey's thunder, but we came out of the same program, and from day one, you were expected to pair program and have test coverage. And I thought that was, that was just the most annoying thing. I'm writing this program twice. Um, and I didn't, I didn't realize that was the beginning of craftsmanship, at least for me. Um, and over time, I began to realize like that safety net of test coverage and a second person to help me think about things um, felt like it was an anxiety reducer, but it's... Um, it, it moved farther and farther away from reducing anxiety and more into um, sharing knowledge and making it easier for other people to work with the code that I've written. And I, I began to really, I think, internalize the value of that to the point where I feel deeply uncomfortable 
if I'm working on something by myself and I'm not writing tests for anything and I'm, I'm just going to ship it. You know, that, that feels terrible. <laughs> um, so the, that feeling is part of it as well. Am I doing the right thing? Um, I don't remember exactly when uh, my first programming job, I was the only developer that was not Windows, uh, the only Ruby developer there. Um, and I was working on something that was, uh, it was a phone system, it was very complicated, the logic behind it. Uh, and there was just no way to know if it was working without creating tests. And I, I don't know where I got that idea, maybe from the Ruby community, um, but it just kind of turned into me advocating for testing in all layers of our stack at that company. Um, and being the new person with no experience, not really well received. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would second what Sarah said that, you know, the, the foundation that we had at MCIT is very rare. The, the emphasis on pair programming, you know, and, and even test driven development, not just, you know, making sure you write tests, but actually test driving. Um, that put me in a really great position uh, straight out of the gate in my first job. But I was lucky too that my first job was at a place called Ternary Software, which doesn't exist anymore. And this was years ago. You guys probably haven't heard of it, but uh, I was out next in. And it was full of, I was the only junior developer there, and it was full of, of developers who were, I, I think at the time, software craftsmanship, the term hadn't really, I'm dating myself now, but it wasn't really a thing uh, that it, back then. But very much um, the culture, the development culture was to do to pair program, uh, to test drive. And um, you know, we produced some amazing software. There's actually a code base that I worked on then, and this was 10 years ago, that uh, is still in production today, and it's beautiful, I've seen it, you know? It's, it's, am it's amazing what really thoughtful uh, development uh, can do to, to a code base. Um, and um, so with, with the, the, the early foundation I got in school and then the mentorship from my early colleagues, uh, I had a fantastic beginning. And then from there, you know, I just kind of took it the, to the next level with uh, Agile Philly. So at the time, you know, Agile Philly, I think this software as a craft and uh, the meetup didn't exist yet. But Agile Philly offered a lot of uh, the same kind of programming and, um, you know, meetup activities to focus on craftsmanship. Well, that wasn't their primary focus. And I ended up um, kicking off like code kata nights. I used to run those at Drexel. That was, that was years ago too. Uh, but, you know, a, a, a once a month kind of get together to do code katas, which are programming exercises. So this is a, an example of like practicing your craft. And it's through activities like that that I took on, you know, in, in my after hours time uh, in, you know, the early to mid part of my career that I think really solidified uh, that early uh, craftsmanship passion and interest. So it sounds like your experiences thus far have been in organizations that are happy to let you pair program and do test driven development and stuff like that. Have you worked at places that haven't, because I definitely have, as I go to smaller and smaller companies, they keep pushing back. I mean, I ignore them, but they keep saying, you can't do that, we don't have time. Like, how do you deal with that or the naysayers or people that think it's not important for the business and you're just wasting time? I don't know if I should answer this question because <laughs> I'm, I'm in a small company now and, and as those here may attest, like we, we've, we have, we have paired programmed, so I'm gonna just go pass. But you still <laughs> test, do you still do test driven development? Uh, oh God, this is the confession portion of software <laughs> Um No, actually in, in, at this point in my development practices, you know, I no longer test drive like I used to. Uh, what I find myself doing is there, there are particular fixes or features that I feel really benefit from test driven development, I will write a test first. And I just did it yesterday, actually. Um, we were doing a fuzzy string matching. And I'm like, you know what this, this needs? This needs a test. So I'm gonna set up my expectations and then I'm gonna implement this algorithm. And um, so I, I still do, but it's, it's much less frequent uh, than it was before. And some of that is like, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of quick mobile UI development. You know, we're, we work, we do a lot of experimental prototype features uh, that, you know, these aren't necessarily going to live on for you. We don't even know if this is worthwhile. We want to ship it fast. You know, that's part of being in, the, in a small startup and a really fast moving startup. Um, yeah, I, I will admit that we, uh, we, we take the cut corners and go fast. And then what we need to make sure that we do as things mature and become things that we want to hold on for, to forever is then take the time to go back and, and refactor and clean it up and for goodness sakes, put automated tests around. We do have continuous integration automated tests. Yeah, I mean, you can very, balance the types of tests. Yes, yes. It doesn't have to be every line everywhere is covered. I will admit, there's, I can always do better. But I'm going <laughs> to pass this over here. So. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I say that I test everything and test it first, but I don't really test views. I just make sure the thing doesn't crash. And I, I think views are more, much more subjective, like, especially on mobile. Like, if you look at it and it looks nice, then it, it works. It's never going to change unless you change it. If you change it, you're going to look at it again. Whereas something that I actually want to test, I will, like, push, like I did this yesterday, actually, I had some logic in the view, and I just pushed it down into a layer that was easily testable, and then just the view is just spitting out the result. Um, but as far as like uh, doing testing or pairing in a in a uh, environment that doesn't really welcome it, um, for pairing it's a lot harder because you know you need a second person. So if you can't convince one of the person to pair with you, then you're not going to be pairing, <laughs> um, or you might be dragging them if you have the authority to do that. Um, but for testing, like I don't think there's really any excuse there. Like if if you want to write tests, nobody's going to fire you for writing tests, uh, and in uh, and actually. Over time, uh, as you get better at it, you will probably be faster at developing features and fixing bugs than if you weren't writing tests. So it's not like you're going to go slower, especially in, in the long term. Uh, you might go slower in the beginning as you learn how to do it. But um, yeah, I think if you want to write tests at work, you should just write tests at work. And my current project, basically, it's this old, unmaintainable thing that has zero tests. So it's slow right now because I'm slowly building out tests as I go. But I'm also rebooting it and have tests from the beginning. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to second, like, you know, t time and place on, on tests and, you know, there's always room for improvement. Um, so I have worked in environments where pairing was, was kind of impossible because um, it, there was a remote team and they were several time zones off. Um, and so that sort of forced compromise positions and, um, and ways to keep conversation going, knowledge share, and have sort of unity around ideas, even though there was really, like, no way we could pair it in a reasonable sense. And so code reviews became... Um, super essential. All that agile practice stuff um, around card grooming, where we had a lot of conversation up front became important. Slack became like hugely important. Um, just to have sort of asynchronous communication, that, that was great. Um, still not ideal. Um, it just everything's a lot slower. Um, and you don't get the value of that sort of collaborative brainstorming. But there, I think there are middle, there are middle ground points. Well, but the like pairing in, in hostile environments, the, the one thing that I find that helps, you know, if, if I've been in, in places where like pairing was kind of like, yeah, okay, we're kind of indifferent to it. I've never been somewhere where, where, where we were hostile to it. Um, but something that really makes a difference is if you have a place to pair, more pairing will happen. And so, you know, we, we had this at Artisan, like we had a dedicated pairing station. You could walk up and plug your laptop in. There were two monitors, two keyboards, two mice, you're ready to go. And if that space exists, people will use it. Even if we don't use it a lot, um, it, it'll get used. And you know, I've been in places where we didn't have a dedicated pairing station. It was a lot harder. And what I would do, because I was by myself, you know, I set up two keyboards, two mice, two monitors at my own desk. And so I could invite my coworkers to come, come and sit with me and pair with me on this. You know, we need to work on this together. Um, and if you don't make the space, it's going to be impossible. So even if it has to be at your own desk, uh, Make it happen. Well, I love the point about making a physical space, but just to add on to the di the um, distance, you can use Screen Hero. I don't know if you've used it, but I kind of love it because you can uh, control each other's computers with it. So I'm working in a very distributed team, like everybody's in Russia or Africa for the most part. I have one person in DC, but we use that to allow us to pair. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I actually did the same thing my first job. I set the keyboard and monitor next to it because we had a spare one. Um, yeah. I, uh, and what Sarah said too, like we, I take a lot of things for granted when I'm talking about like software craftsmanship or, or other aspects of like testing or um, or, or pairing or, or anything else. Um, yeah, like like pairing is not like looking over somebody's shoulder while they drive, and uh, it's it, like you need a dedicated space for it. And then also like what Sarah said, like continuous integration, and, um, continuous deployment. Like these are things I just kind of take for granted, but I kind of like. Uh, I think that's much for granted. They're almost like a requirement. Like, I never works somewhere that didn't have them. Yeah. Oh, um, my. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't have taken most of my <laughs> jobs. <laughs> like, I came in to set that stuff up. Yeah, uh, yeah, or, yeah or, or the ability to, to do those things. Um, yeah. Awesome. So what is non-negotiable in your own process? For me, um, like I said, if they try to tell me I can't do tests, I'm just going to do it. That's part of my flow that like with the Android with Katas for example like I have this Android Kata thing I've been doing and I'm I test drive from the beginning when I write my stuff and I break it out to different places and it's just 
I'm going to do what I'm going to do. If you don't like it, you can fire me. But <laughs> not everyone is like as established in their career and can have that point of view. So like, what is non-negotiable for you and what does that look like? Yeah, I think that's like a, a privilege of being a professional and saying like these are the practices that I'm going to do because I'm a professional. And, um, yeah, like I I require that you know I, I guess freedoms are a test, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, but like CI is, is very important. I would deploy the software and actually check that it's working. Um, I don't know what else. For me. Um, I don't want to be super insulated from the demands of the business. I really want to understand why these cards are prioritized the way, this is such an agile talk, why these cards are prioritized the way they are, um, and what the driving pressure is so I can make better decisions. Um, I think there's sometimes this sort of desire to have a disconnect between the business side and the development side. Um, but if you want to, you know, if you're asking me to make smart decisions, I, I'd love to know, like a non-negotiable for me is knowing what the external pressure is. Yeah, I really hate being isolated and just told what to do. Here's your next widget. Build this widget. Right. I would, I would second that, too. Um, I definitely like to work closely with business, but at the same time, I like to maintain uh, like authority for the team. The team has the authority to make technical decisions uh, and that the, the team needs to be listened to. You know, if, if there's a little give and take sometimes with, with features where you know, technically this is something we can't do or this is something we need to do and that the, the, the technical team, uh, they need the freedom to make their own decisions and they need the, the kind of mutual respect back and forth between tech and business so that both sides understand priorities and functionality. But as far as what's non-negotiable for me, I'm, I'm gonna say source control. I didn't used to say this, but I've met so many people that like work in places without source control. I'm like, are you? I, I don't, How? it does not compute. How? <laughs> oh, I don't know, but you know, the, it's a small thing, but you take it for granted and there are people out there who don't have it. Uh, use source control and continuous integration. If it's not there, I will set it up in the very first day. Uh, I, I did that you know, when I came to SnipSnap. Um, and um, yeah, tests, you know, I, again, I, I'm not gonna ask permission to write tests. I, I will write tests when I think it's appropriate. That's my prerogative as a professional. And I'm not just doing this because this is how I like it. I'm doing this because it's in the business's best interest. Uh, your software is gonna be better. And along those same lines, um, you know, I, I'm in a position <coughs> in my career where, you know, I. I get a little bit of authority over, you know, this is how, you th I do get heard when I say like this is something we need to do technically speaking, but I'm not going to ask permission to do refactoring, for example, like this, there, there are times when you have to plan into the sprint, like we need to do this in order to ship this next feature, or in order to keep this running, we need to spend some time fixing something that we wrote a long time ago, somebody else wrote a long time ago. And um, you know it's a negotiation with priorities and things like that, but like I, I will make myself heard, and, and I'm not, I'm, you know, this needs to happen. If I'm saying this needs to happen, it's for the business, it's for the health of the software. It's, it's honestly, usually an impacting user experience at the end of the day. So um, that that I will make those things a priority as well for the environment. It's important that the business and the culture supports that kind of back and forth between tech and business. I forgot code reviews are non-negotiable. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Code awesome. Um, well, that's a good segue to what you're talking about, Audrey, to um, how do you nurture it in your teams? I know you and I both have managed. I'm not sure um, if y'all have. But like, how do you, either with your peers or with your direct reports, how do you encourage them to view their work as craftsmanship and help them get better at it? Uh, my team's here today. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, I, I would say, this may sound weird, but I want to I give them permission to to, to it, pursue their passion and their interest in improving themselves. And if that means conferences or, you know, if you want a book or if you want a training, you know, like, you, you, not, you have my permission. That, that goes without saying. And, and furthermore, I, I encourage that. Um, I think setting an example yourself is a big part of that. Like this, like, I, I am working to improve myself. I'm, 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 I'm teaching. I enjoy teaching. I'm, I'm also learning. And I go to conferences and I read these books and I do these exercises. And then beyond that, doing the hard work to fight for if there, you know, for when there are times where like that we need to do some refactoring and we need to allocate time in the sprint for, you know, automating, you know, fixing this automated build, you know, that this is a priority, like that I will defend my team and my team's time to make those things happen, that I value these and making that clear. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it works. You can ask those guys later. I know it can be definitely hard to convince the higher ups we need more time and space and leave us alone yeah. to do what we need to do. How about peers if you're not managing directly? Um, I guess uh, in, in code view or just kind of general 
um, whether pairing or, or, or general like mentoring, just kind of like talking to people and encouraging them to take the time to, you know, refactor something or, or, or write tests or, or I, th I think just getting good feedback is really important, being direct and um, also kind of compassionate at the same time. I, I'm totally going to steal your answer. How about that? So I, um, I went to a really interesting conference two weeks ago, and I walked away thinking, like, like, of all the things you do as a team, I think your code review is the clearest articulation of your team's culture. Um, do you, you know, even if, even if it's just kind of like a pile of disaster, are you at least acknowledging that somebody took the time to write something? Are you starting that dialogue? Um, and especially in remote teams, all those awesome tools around GitHub are super, super important. It's a way to, to keep people engaged in the work that other people are doing. And for me, like, looping back to a question we had 20 minutes ago, for um, one of those moments where I think you begin to think of yourself as a craftsman is when you stop writing code for yourself and start writing it for somebody else, as, as if somebody else has to maintain this. Um, and I think that is that nice feedback loop. Um, if your team is just spending a lot of time picking through the code and thinking like, is this sustainable? Is this, you know, using the language in an enigmatic way? Are there, are, am, I, am I rolling my own when I really don't have to? Um, those sorts of concerns. Um, so I'd say like, get really, really good at code review um, and then build on top of that positive relationship around code. Awesome. So how do you find other craftspeople when you're hiring? And what do you look for in the interview process? Hopefully it's not code on the whiteboard. I hate those <laughs> interviews, but I don't know. What do you what do y'all do? They probably say the same things we do. <laughs> yeah. Well, they talk about it with passion, you mean? Like, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean I I look for people who talk about trying to improve their skills. And and sometimes that's in their free time or sometimes that's at work, you know, but but someone who demonstrates <coughs> like they're they're curious and, and interested <coughs> in, in learning more about, you know, for, for best words like the the craft of software development like the you know refactoring techniques or you know there you can learn new languages and tools and, and those are all useful and really important uh, but there's this extra layer of craft that you know if they, to see some curiosity about that it's not required for me to hire somebody uh, that that uh, that demonstrates that necessarily it's not a, a no go no go for a hiring decision but I get extra excited about somebody when they do um, I like to ask questions about like what's the best code base you've ever worked in and what's the worst one and listen to them talk about like why because uh, that can kind of reveal like where they're in their career like you know within their development as, as craftspeople uh, like where are they in, in like you know understanding code and, and how code can can go well and, and go very very badly um, yeah they just talk about things like refactoring and testing um, you know sometimes you'll ask somebody and they're like you know you know, give me examples of a time where you refactored something, and sometimes they can't answer that question, which again doesn't mean that they're a bad hire or anything, but kind of gives you an idea of where they are, um, you know, in, in their career and in their development. And same with testing, you know. Um, what do you think about testing? Some people are like, yeah, you know. And some people get really excited and talk about it a lot, and, and that just kind of reveals a lot about the kind of developer they're going to be. Yeah, I ask a lot of questions about testing as well. And I like to look for people who are involved in the community and giving back their knowledge. It doesn't have to be conference speaking like I'm doing, but it could be just going to the local meetup or, you know, things like that. Have a blog where you're sharing the knowledge that you've gained with others. And then I really like to do pairing interviews too, because those are pretty great to figure out how much of a jerk they'll be if we try to <laughs> pair later. Um, yeah, for me, craftsmanship and mentoring are like, so deeply like connected um, because the languages are going to change and you're going to be expected to learn new things and you're going to you know be expected to help other people learn and knowledge share so if in an interview you can talk about a time you mentored somebody else um, filled a knowledge gap for them recognized a silo and tried to bust that silo those are all really positive things um, awesome uh, so what is the role of community in your craftsmanship can you elaborate? I don't know. Like, do you go to meetups? Do you you do a podcast? You know, like. <laughs> um, yeah, I um, yeah. When I'm trying to get better at anything, I kind of uh, envelop myself in the in the community and the culture. Whether it's like listening to podcasts, going to meetups, um, going to conferences. Uh, it could be you know following certain people on Twitter that are in the community or have. Um, or like it used to be, like you know, Google Reader, I would add you know, blogs and RSS feeds, but I don't do that too much anymore. Um, 
See, I, I just like uh, surrounding myself with a lot of information about the topic to, to get better at it. Um, I love going to meetups. Yeah, meetups have always been a really important part of my crafts learning. Uh, I mentioned Agile Philly and, and the Code Kata nights I used to run, which don't happen anymore. If anybody wants to pick up that baton, I'll <laughs> get resources for you. Uh, it would be great for software as a craft too. But you know, having a community of people that are interested in learning the same kinds of things and getting together with them regularly and practicing, um, that really helps. Conferences, to me, still are a big part of that. And um, Philly ETE was just recently, and you know, there are talks there that were, that were interesting. And, and you know, you be surprised what you learn. And also, the, I wanted to give a, a shout out for the Simple Design and Testing Conference. If you ever get a chance to go to Simple Design and Testing Conference, uh, it, it's one of the most fascinating uh, learning experiences I've had with regard to like software as a craft in particular. Talking about testing, talking about refactoring. Um, it's a small group. It's it's mixed. Like they're very very senior, uh, well known people there, and and people like me at the time were early in their careers, and you know a very open uh, kind of conference where you could do hands on code reviews and and, and talk one on one. I learned a lot there. Uh, Really, I read a lot of books and things like that, but it's these meetups and conferences that really, I think, made me a craftsman. Craft well, I wanted person. to thank everyone for sharing their knowledge here tonight. Uh, one last, uh, this morning anyway, uh, one last question. Um, so what is your favorite resource or the thing that made you change your mind or whatever you want to share? But one resource from each of you. And yep, yeah, that's it. That's my question. Um, I'll throw out the book Clean Code, the Uncle Bob book. Um, it's a go-to. If, if anyone who is really young and they're getting into software development, I always buy this book and give it to them. Like, just, just read it. You don't have to follow it like a Bible or anything, but like, just read it and, and learn from it. Yeah, it was a good book. A lot of the examples are in uh, Java, I think, yeah. but they're not really like Java-specific at all. Yeah. It's just about you know, um, how to work on code. Um, resources. <laughs> Planting is totally fine. Um, so uh, there, there's a resource that I read weekly, and it's mostly to keep my head in that software engineering um, craftsmanship game called the Software Lead Weekly, um, which is just a curated list of blog posts um, around hiring and culture and um, what, how you define success and all those metrics that I think we are, we're all really interested in. Um, and so it's more, for me at least, about the repeated dose of like, why are you in this, you know, what ha is goodness being redefined as for an industry? Um, yeah, it's just, I guess, my weekly kata around the, the concepts of craftsmanship. I, I guess one thing that I've always uh, really enjoyed is I find that I learn a lot from watching other people uh, code or even pair. Um, there is a series of videos, uh, now defunct, called Peep Code, where there was, um, it was like $12, $15, and you could like buy a two-hour video of somebody programming on a problem, talking about it uh, in a language or a framework. Uh, they got bought by some other company that Plural they use. Pluralsight, you need a subscription to actually do them now. Um, but those are really good. I'm sure there's some other ones online, too. Um, I'm sure you could find people that have either um, done uh, code reviews or or a pair and like publish it on YouTube. Um, there's people that program on Twitch TV or uh, livecoding.tv, I think. Um, or if you just go to like any like, uh, if you see any like conference videos of people like live code or, or just talk to people. Like I just, I just find so much just by watching somebody else use their editor and, and talk about what they're doing and like I might find a new pattern, new technique that I hadn't thought about before. Um, so yeah, I, I put a lot of value in watch, watching other people do the work. Great, thank you. All right, thank you. We have some time for questions, if that's okay. We have some time for questions, if that's all right. Um, do any of you have questions for our, for our panelists? Thanks. So, do you guys have set rules or, I don't know, guidelines you do for code reviews? Like, how do you sort of structure your code reviews to make them more productive because sometimes they're very, um, you know, I've been at ones that it range anywhere from like useless, where it's just all like nitpicky stuff that didn't really matter, and ones that were, you know, actually pretty pretty good. But is there something in particular you guys do to try to make them be at the good end? Um, 
Uh, on one hand, I, I really uh, dislike the nitpicky reviews, but on the other hand, when I'm reviewing code and there's a lot of like, you know, ugly syntax or other issues that are more cosmetic, it's really hard for me to see the structure of the code when all I see is that stuff. Um, so I don't completely discount them. Um, and I think like code linting tools help with that. Um, in Ruby, you can use something like Rubicop, which is iffy, but um, in other languages uh, like Go, there's a formatting tool that makes it all the code look the same. Um, and yeah, as far as like um, code reviews, I feel like when, you, when you're when you actually submitting code to a review, and this could be part of the review too, uh, you know, smaller is better. Uh, when you get a, there's, there's a joke that if you get a, uh, uh, ten, 10 line pull requests, there'll be 10 comments. If you get a thousand line pull request, you'll just get a thumbs up. Because <laughs> nobody will ever read the entire thing and understand it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it, it's kind of on the, the onus of the person submitting the code to, to kind of make it small and manageable and, and easily um, understandable. And even sometimes if it's a really like complex code review, um, you might just want to hop on a, if you're, if you're remote, hop on a call or go over to their desk if you're on site uh, and just kind of talk about it as you're reviewing it, uh, which would also help. Um, but and, and I think that like as far as the nitpicky things like those issues don't usually persist. Like if you if you nitpick the same person for the same things two or three times, they'll stop doing that. If, if, it, if it's a, if the convention your team agrees on, um, it's not really a long term problem. I don't think. And I think the point about nitpicking is interesting because like craftspersonship is the focus on the small details. So sometimes there will be nitpicky feedback that might seem annoying to you at the time, but really makes it more readable and maintainable over the long haul. I, I think I see a lot of really good code pretty often, but that's not the stuff that you call out in code review. You're calling out the nitpicky stuff. Um, I, so I think that's an important part of a good code review um, is when you see something good, you, you point that out and you say, that's an awesome one-liner. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think that, that builds a lot um, and makes that sort of nitpicky stuff, which is really important, more palatable. I just want to second the size. I, my general guideline is like, you know, 500 lines, like that's about my limit for really just seeing the big picture uh, for 500 diff lines. But um, something else that we do when something is big and sometimes when it's not, but I think as the person is submitting the code, you know, you know we just right there in the GitHub pull request explain just give, give a little bit of upfront, like this is what I did here, this is why, like as much clear, concise information as you can about like this change that you're making uh, to give the code reviewer context. Because we're all, you know, doing our own things, you know, I come over, you know, to do a peer code review and I don't necessarily remember why we said we were gonna do this or anything, so you just throw, throw your peer code reviewer a bone and, and explain it in the, in the pull request uh, description, assuming you're using a GitHub pull request. Um, and if we do an in-person, you know, to have that person do a walkthrough, and I find, especially for bigger ones, like to leave the diff and go over to the live code and do the walkthrough over there. Uh, for, for larger pull requests especially, I find it's the only way to really get the big picture. It's like, take me on a guided tour of all these changes. And then I'll f for big ones especially, like I'll follow up after that, go back into the diff, and then I'll do more of the nitpicky thing before we give the final ship it squirrel. You know, part of that is like, so for me, when I, I, if you read my commits, they're kind of meticulous. Like I write five, 10 lines, depending on what I've done in that commit. I usually try to keep them small, but with test driven development, they get bigger and bigger because I know things are working as I go on. So it's useful for later when I'm like, these are the things I've done to implement this feature because then you can just go through the commits. Other questions? Uh, do you have any advice for spreading craftsmanship practices across large organizations where there's lots of small teams? I think that if, um, if, if you're on a team in an organization like that and there's a lot of other teams, I think that if um, you demonstrate your team's ability to ship feature, features um, and, and do it in a very stable way, like if, if if other teams are having like quality issues or the response times in their APIs or whatever are like too too large or other issues and but your team is consistently like kind of solid, management will notice that and ask what you're doing and, and give you the resources um, to kind of spread that out throughout the organization. And I think one uh, good tool to, to use there is to move people around between the teams, um, kind of cross pollinate. If if you have like one team that's really great at testing and all the other teams are not great at testing, you know split that team up, uh, send like two of them to one team and, and uh, they'll 
hopefully evangelize that team into, into that, and then that'll eventually spread larger. Well, it also spreads from peer to peer, too. So um, my time at Comcast, I, when I got there, the testing wasn't really focused. One person came, and they really were into testing. And then slowly, one by one, all the other people started doing it. So um, other people do see what you're doing. So leading by example is pretty important. Yeah, I'm going to plus one spreading, moving people around on Teams. I, I forget what I used to call this. I did a blog post on this. Like, I actually switched with a, a buddy in a different company just to like s for a day go sit with them and see what their job is like and see the practices that they're using that was just for my own individual development but if you have a big company you can do that from team to team to team and see what you can learn but i believe that you know like craftsmanship like these practices if they're not already there like it has to be kind of a grassroots thing and you need to find other the other people there who share your interest and your desire to to make things better and you know, a way to find them can be to like set up something internal, like an in-house, like maybe do a code cut a night or something. See who comes, and or you know, maybe it's watching a video if you're not ready to like set up coding exercises, which I hope grant is, is a lot of work, but you know, it can be really um, rewarding to build those relationships. So you just have each other for support, but that also spreads the uh, you know, each one person touches you know many other people um, will make the change a lot faster. But I think it's in my experience, it's been easier to spread it from the bottom up, just finding other developers who shared my interest, then trying to go to, to convince management, like, look how great we're doing. It's because of our craftsmanship. Go mandate that to the other people. Like, I've never seen that work in my experience, um, but I have had luck spreading it from peer to peer. Yeah, I really like the idea of like hosting an internal lunch workshop or something. It's like, hey, we're going to do a kata or we're going to do whatever. And then that really brings people in. And you can find your uh, conspirators. Yes, conspirators. You could also hire a consultant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plus one that. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, just a quick question. How big are each of your companies? Um, how many teams do you guys have? Like, what is the team member size and what's the makeup of it? Of, say, like, uh, designers versus architects versus engineers? So for me, before the mic gets over here, I'm working at a, a company that's installing solar in Africa. Most of the people are there in operations in Tanzania. But as far as the software team, there's like five people, seven people now, if you don't count the Russian contractor group. So like we have one designer, which we just hired, and there's me who runs the Android. I now have a second Android dev. And then there's Web and the CTO and uh, the guy right under him, the VP of engineering. So we have a very small team for me. I'm a consultant. Um, so I, the consultant team here has like 15 to 20 uh, engineers. I'm farmed out to a small startup. Um, and I'm part of a, a three-person in-house team that's part of a larger like eight-person engineering team at the, the client. Um, I, I couldn't tell you about their, their makeup of designers uh, versus it's mostly an API. Um. My team is, uh, we have uh, three, three back-end engineers, two front-end engineers, um, and the front-end people also do most of the design uh, as well as the product manager. Um, my company's a little unique, though, because all the teams kind of work on these small open source tools, um, and then the team that I'm on is the only uh, web product. Uh, and then we also have an operations team, which is, which is growing. And also, our, our company has, you know, tripled in size in the past year. Um, so it's been a lot of moving around and restructuring. Um, but yeah, it's a, I, I find in, in, in the past too, like a good team size. Like I, I never like really want to get more than, you know, eight engineers tops. But you know, smaller, smaller is better. And if that requires breaking up the application into smaller parts to facilitate that, that's a good thing. Yeah, my team is also small. Uh, we're, you know, we're a small startup here in Philly. We've got uh, five engineers. We've got, you know, one back end, one front end, and three mobile. And uh, we have two design resources. Uh, my experience, you know, this the size of five. We consider ourselves here in Philly like a team. We're an engineering team that we work on uh, different parts. Um, and even though we have two design resources, you know, it is tight. Um, I at Artisan before we had a, an engineering team of five at one point and one designer, and that actually worked really well. Um, the the size, I think, of the ratio between like you know different different engineers working on different parts or designers to engineers um, has less to do with like how many of them you have as to like how flexible those individuals are. And the more you can wear multiple hats and like switch roles as needed, there's the higher functioning the team's been in general. Uh, but five has been a great size. I've definitely tried. We tried even at Artisan. We tried doing three. Um, you know, at, at Drexel there were times where we had 
two, sometimes one. Um, it's definitely like three, three always feels tight, like you don't get enough done. And five has been a really sweet number for me, for, for development teams. Um, and you know, having, having the one designer has worked well, and having two feels tight. So I think it really just depends on uh, what you're building and how flexible everyone is. Great, that's all the time we have. Uh, you can feel free to ask more questions of the panelists. Um, and we want to thank all four for, uh, again, for being on our panel.